Hi, dear attendees, we will wait a few more minutes until more attendees join us and then we start the session today. Just wait a few more minutes, please. <coughs> I think we can start now. Hi and welcome to our CSA Digital Email Summit and our session for today is DMARC is here to stay, now what? Um, my name is Michael and I'm part of the Certified Senders Alliance. Perhaps you don't know the Certified Senders Alliance or you, or you don't know what we do. Um, we will be glad to give you more information. Just feel, feel free to contact us after the webinar and we will get back to you. And yes, as you can see, we have two sponsors doing the spring edition. Uh, first of all, Steve Martian and Harlon, thank you both for supporting us during the spring edition. And the attendees, if you want to get more information about the Martian or Harlan or both, maybe um, you can find the sponsoring booklet in the download section. It might be on the white side on your screen. And then, of course, you can contact the uh, sponsors directly. And um, yeah, the housekeeping rules for today. Um, they are a little bit different than the webinars before. So you are not, uh, of course, you're muted during the world webinar, but you can ask your questions during the webinar, webinar um, by raising your hand. You can um, ask them live or you can use the chat function. It's also on the uh, control panel on the white screen. Um, if you want to talk or if you want to ask your questions, just raise up your hand, we see it, and Patrick and um, Alex will answer your questions during the webinar. Of course, you can submit your questions also at the end of the webinar. It's up to you how you want um, to use it. Of course, you can uh, ask the question live or you can write your question. And yes, as I mentioned, our speaker for today, uh, Alex and Patrick, I'm happy that they found the time today to speak with us um, about the topic DMARC. And um, yeah, I think that's enough for me today, uh, for me now. And um, I will hand over to Patrick, who starts the presentation. And um, as I mentioned, you will hear me during the webinar again. So if you have any questions or something like that, you can write um, in chat during the chat, fun chat fun function, sorry, um, directly to me or to the speaker. It's up to you. So see you soon and here you bye. So hello, everybody. Um, let's see. I'll have to adjust that here. Yeah. And you should probably see my screen now. So how do we start? I think we didn't uh, discuss about that, Alex, did we? Um, we start, let's, let's, let's start by, by something that happened a few years ago when I attended an IETF meeting in Berlin. Um, I saw a few really excited People at the IITF talking about something that was very new to me was called DMARC. And uh, when they explained it uh, and had explained it to me, I, I thought, yeah, that's going to be something that we'll have, we'll have to do within the next years because it has um, the power um, to diminish phishing, which is a larger problem uh, right now. So, um, as it goes, there have been a few years um working on dmark because dmark had a few issues it still has a few issues but it's uh, production ready and people have begun to use it and that's why alex and i thought we would start a presentation about that because we think you should be uh on board when it takes place because dmark will have an impact in your business um yep. alex would you like to to start with a presentation and i uh, scroll the slides or sure sure that's fine yeah that sounds good to me uh i mean yeah start with there Okay, let me see. <laughs> so overall, uh, obviously, email has grown. The internet usage has grown. Uh, it's become quite clear that uh, uh, an abundance of e-commerce or commerce in general is happening on the internet. It's now no longer just for, you know, surfing personal web pages and watching videos. People, there's e-commerce is a large portion of what happens on the internet, and 
a lot of that is run by very large brands who customers have allegiance to. For example, you know, if it's their favorite grocery store, or their favorite clothing store, whatever that may be, uh, and they send out messages all the time. They communicate with their customers, uh, and you know, they we operate back and forth with those entities. Um, it's not just enough that uh, we visit the website. They, you know, they we invite them into our inbox and they provide information to us. So. Let me I have that check, sorry. On. Yeah, here you go. Sorry. Uh, yep, that's okay. So uh, I, I think a lot of people understand what phishing is. Uh, phishing uh, is is something where uh, a um, an attacker sends you a message and tricks you into entering some personal information into a website. Most often that's credentials, but it could be other information as well. Uh, and when you enter those credentials, it could be related to uh, a banking site. It could be you could be entering your credit card credentials, and then they can use that information to go somewhere and uh, pretend to be you or use your information to to obtain some services or some products. Uh, these the the way that that really ends up working, or the way that it is most effective, is if they can pretend to be you, and so they can best pretend to be you by using a domain that customers understand they recognize and they trust um, if you know so if you uh, you know if it's just grocery store.com and they that's where they do all their shopping and they can somehow create a false uh, a fictitious message that it looks to be exactly that then that's potentially an issue they uh, you know they can use that information or, or from your bank whatever that may be um, but they can use that information to again try to get into your account and you know empty your bank account, steal, you know, order services or goods in your name, that kind of thing, and send them somewhere else. So anything to add there, Patrick? Uh, well, yeah, think of, uh, of your, my company is a service provider and we have a trusted relationship with our customers and somebody writes a mail message to, to one of our customers in, impersonating either you or me and asking them to submit their identity to fix some, some online issue or something like that. People will very likely react to that and enter the data because they think the message is coming from you or from me. Right. So it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be the, the large uh, grocery platforms. It could be a, a, a service provider relationship. No? Yeah, somebody who's selling you goods or services typically. So. Yeah. So in general, the the way that DMARC works is uh, there's there's a couple uh, there's there's two main authentication methods and one is uh, to use SPF um, and then the other one's called DKIM and we'll get into those in a little bit but it allows you to control or or advertise uh, that these messages are yours you're basically taking uh, you're telling the receiver that these messages are yours and and you authorize them to be delivered, you're taking um, accountability for those messages and whatever the content of those messages may be. Uh, so it helps in terms of, you know, if, if Patrick sends out a message and says, hey, like I need you to, to go to my website, hopefully that message, if DMARC passes, if all the authentication methods pass, then you can tell that, or, or the, the receiver should be able to tell that this looks authentic and we can, you know, we can do the right thing with this. It still may be subject to spam controls, you know, content scanning, but at least from the authentication perspective, it looks correct. Um, the other part that's in here is that it mentions briefly is, is uh, provides a method for reports. Um, and so those reports can help you, the domain holder, understand more about who is sending as you. Uh, and so as we'll get into that a little bit more as well. So we've gone through some of this, and I wanted to, I wanted to really get into uh, so that's what DMARC stands for, um, SPF and DKIM. SPF effectively is telling a receiver which host should be sending as your domain, and so that's typically tied to the envelope sender, which you can't really tell, but uh, it's it's a it's so the these IPs are responsible for my my ISP or my company. Uh, DKIM is a cryptographic signature. We sign the message. And then uh, through cryptography methods, when the receiver get, receives the message, it can verify that you were actually the sender of that message. And that the message did not get... Um, so it was not tampered with. Exactly, while it was in transfer, no? Right, transfer. 
has not been altered. And so that's that's important. Um, that's what the signature is meant to cover. It doesn't just cover. It's not just the little blurb in the top. It actually is meant to cover the the you know the body of the message as well, and some of the more important metadata details. Um, so in order for DMARC to work, one of SPF or DKIM must work. And if it doesn't, then there are policies that can be applied. So there's the policy of none, quarantine, or reject. Um, <clears throat> and so typically, uh, those are the the actions are none means just goes right to the inbox. Quarantine means just go to the spam folder, and reject means it should be rejected before you know the the receiver, the, the ISP or email provider can do anything with it. Um, these are really recommendations. The receiver can override those policies, but they are typically obeyed. Um, so one thing that again we'll get into a little bit more is the reporting. The reporting allows domain holders again to see who is who's acting as them, um, and it's important to the receivers. Uh, or to the, I'm sorry, to the brands, to the senders, to understand who is sending as them, or, because ha otherwise, how do you know that a the DMARC is doing anything for you, or that anybody is obeying the the policy that you have recommended? Uh, so if if Patrick were to send me an email and I just and I don't inspect the the SPF and DKIM and DMARC, uh, that's fine. You wouldn't expect to get a report, but if I am and I'm acting on it, you would expect to get a report so that you can understand that I'm doing what you're asking. Um, and I'm doing the right thing. So mm -hmm. uh, I need uh, to interrupt. Sorry, mm -hmm. we have That's a okay. question so far. Okay. Um, uh, via the chat function, I will read the questions out loud. Okay. What do you mean with hacked up variation of DMARC? Uh, I was just about to get to that. So ah, okay. I'm good, good <laughs> <lead in. laughs> That's good. So <laughs> there are there are some organizations, some receivers, who uh, this is not about uh, um, this is not about the senders. This is about the receivers. So the receivers can implement some variation of DMARC and not follow the spec uh, really to, to, to the as best as they should. Um, so what ends up happening is that brands may not understand why the messages are being treated the way that they are. Uh, so just just that's just something to be cautious of. Um, so that if you're if you're making changes in a way that uh, just doesn't it doesn't follow the same interactions as everybody else. That could cause, again, cause confusion for everybody else. Patrick, does that sort of make sense to you, or is that, do you have anything else there to add? Uh, I concur. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's something that is it's a cautionary tale. It's not something. It's it's not hard and fast. It's a cautionary tale to say, you know, if you treat DMARC differently than everybody else, it's you know anybody who <laughs> understands DMARC won't may not understand what's going on. So. Yeah. If if you want to maybe maybe the, the word is. That if you want to establish a way of sender authentication and uh, create, build a reputation system on that, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You want to follow. You want to stay with what DMARC has come up with. And like it or not, SPF and DKIM and DMARC are going here to stay. That's actually the reason we came up with the title for the slides. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of criticism about that, but uh, they're they're production ready. People are using it, and we think you should be using it too. So don't do your own thing. Follow this, follow those rules. So this is a short chart, uh, small chart, of the growth of DMARC over the years. Uh, and this this comes from DMARC.org, and every year they publish a, a sort of chart that shows a little bit of growth. And you can see that over the years, this is, I mean, you know, I, I think when I first started really working on more DMARC stuff, it was still down in the hundreds of thousands. And now, you know, if we're up to millions, three million domains, that's an incredible growth. <clears throat> Excuse me, incredible growth over the last four or five years. Uh, that is, you know, and that it seems to be, I don't know about accelerating, but it's definitely still growing at a fairly rapid pace. Um, and I think it really under underscores the importance of DMARC and that senders understand the value. So, anything for yeah, you? And we, and we, yeah, we would still could say that those the numbers we see here are the uh, the kind of the early adopters. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the technical savvy people who are interested to get it done and like to experiment with that. But um, um, I would, I'm pretty sure we're going to see a, a, a huge increase by numbers as um, the large platforms are going to uh, require DMOG authentication or center authentication in, in the future. Right. No? I think so. Okay. <laughs> so, one of the other things, you know, we've, we've heard some. 
concerns, I guess maybe not concerns, uh, some skepticism that reports aren't really necessary. And, and we're here to tell you that they really are. Um, you know, it's both on the sending and the receiving side. So on the sending side, as the brand holder, you would like to receive reports to understand more about who is using your domain. You know, if you are, if your policies are being honored, um, if you have any misconfigurations, the misconfigurations are a huge part of reporting. You know, uh, the DKIM and SPF, you may not understand that something, you know, you added or changed to your SPF record. It may seem innocent, but all of a sudden it has caused your SPF record to become invalid. And that's potentially extremely important. Um, you know, secure, you'll always hear people say security is a process and things like that. So you should, even if you don't look at these every day um, or you don't have a vendor to analyze them for you, you should still look at them once in a while, uh, that sort of thing, um, especially just after making changes. Um, so, uh, but, and I mentioned in here also, it's not just for brands. Uh, I say mailbox providers, it could be ISPs, however you like to term that. Um, you know, if as you know, if you're running a, an ISP and someone's phishing as your uh, communication brand, as your communication domain. So let's say you send from uh, notifications at isp.com, and someone is phishing your customers using that same domain. You would, you know, you should know about that. Um, you know, and from the receiver side, from the from the ISP side, why are these important? You know, it's if you would like senders to utilize message authentication, you need to let them know that a that you're doing it and that you're you know you're doing your best to to uh, to honor their policies and things like that, and to help them understand where DMARC is working for them, um, or if it's misconfigured, you know, help them again understand how that's uh, um, how that's affecting their their deliverability. So, anything there, Patrick? You'd like to add? Yeah, you. Um, um, well, I've done a few projects um, within the last years where we uh, introduced uh, SPF DKIM and DMARC to really large platforms. And um, uh, something I learned during that time is that you, what you what you really want to do, you want to have a staging plan. So you want to start with with policies for SPF that will say, well, we're just testing here, and DMARC also, we're just testing here. You know. Um, also, setting that the, uh, there is another flag for DKIM where you can also say we're testing right now. Mm -hmm. We'll start with that because if you have a larger platform, it's quite likely you, you will have something wrong, not, not on purpose, but simply because things happen, you know? Um, it's um, And these reports help you understand it, as you roll out those testing it, it, modes. Exactly. So, so when you start sending with testing mode and you start receiving reports and you go, oh, I didn't know that. And, oh, oh, that's something interesting. Oh, oh, they should be accepting my messages, but they don't. So we should, probably should get in contact with them and start discussing what's going wrong. And once you have that, you're you're pretty. You can be sure you're not going to lose messages as you're going to um, get stricter policies to say, listen, now we go for team current team. And, uh, um, and from, with the ultimate goal to say no, our ultimate goal is to have a reject level. That that would be the real protection level, you know. So mm -hmm. you want to you want to do something, do a step, take a look at the report, see what's going on, and then decide if you can proceed or need to stop and fix things and go and go on. Yeah, yep. that's what the reports are important for. It's actually, one of the things that we've been talking receivers, big receiver platform, is if you want DMARC, you will have to um, add report capabilities. Often they they don't they think they don't will have to do that because you know they don't see the money in it. But we but we tell them you know if you want DMARC you need the reporting because we're not going to start DMARC without the reporting because we lose we might lose messages. How will we know without reports? Mm -hmm. So one of the concerns that we've heard <laughs> over time is. Uh, about the privacy in aggregate reports, and uh, we'd like to we'd like to just make sure that folks understand there really shouldn't be any concern as it relates to privacy. Um, you know, in terms of customer data, there really shouldn't be any. These aggregate reports contain exactly what they say. They're aggregate data. There's no, there shouldn't really be. Uh, in most cases, you won't find an email address, things like that. Um, you know, there's the email address that is in there is related to the reporting entity or the receiving entity. It's not about the the consumer of the message. Um, and the same thing with IP addresses there, you won't find a customer IP address in there. Uh, you know, there's, I, there are forensic reports and we didn't really cover that today, but forensic reports do have more data and there's could be some information there that may be questionable, but it's not as, um, those are not as prevalent 
Um, so I, we don't really want to cover them as much, but that's something if you would like to talk to, to a DMARC expert about, you know, we understand. So Patrick, anything to add there? Yeah, for N3D parts, it's at least as far as I recall, are going to be deprecated because they're really too data heavy. Yeah. Um, so um, while they were interesting in, in the start, uh, they're, they're good to debug. Actually for postmarsers, they contain a lot of information you want to have at your own hands when you start debugging and to figure, try to figure out what is going wrong. But from a, um, um, from a data protection regulation perspective, they're uh, definitely a no-go. Yeah, th there's been discussions about instead of abandoning them, changing there to be varying levels of forensic reports, I think is what the, they're suggesting now, um, where one might be you just get a set of headers, you don't get any, uh, you don't get any content, for example. So, mm -hmm. uh, but that's, you know, there's still some potentially questionable content in the headers. So, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see how that kind of turns out, but that's, that's in the future. So. Yeah, maybe the takeaway on this slide is if you want to stay on the safe side, use aggregate reports. Yeah, You're aggregate reports. And you're good. Aggregate yeah. yeah, they should be good for now, and and again, they're 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 beneficial to both the sender and the receiver. So, mm -hmm. again, the receiver is it's mostly beneficial because it encourages senders to use DMARC. So, and shows you're participating. Uh, so, Patrick, I think so. Should, go ahead. So, why would anybody want to worry about um, as a sender um, about DMARC? Well. As we already said, it's going to be adopted. They're not only discussing it anymore that they would like to do it, they are in the midst of adopting it and rolling it out. And uh, the testing um, has been taking place over the last years, and there are a few things that have been tested. And so far, um, at least the major platforms are already using it in, in, in their interchange. Um, as they go on, as they go on, they will start not only to test it anymore, but they will set it into effect, which means they will actively begin to reject messages if they don't comply with DMARC policies anymore. Um, that will likely have an impact on your business because uh, from at least for measurements that we have from different platforms, we know that many um, senders um, and especially uh, email service providers uh, have um, well, let's have it politely have their issues with sending DMA compliant messages. Um, and once the receiver end will start to reject messages, this is going to have a direct impact on your business because you will not get the delivery to the, sorry, that's a hard word for a German, the deliverability rate. Um, they will not, you are not going to be able to get the deliverability rate you wanted to have or used to have for your customers. And your customers will probably be a little upset. And the worst of it, they will have no idea what DMARC is and what they need to do about it. So you should probably, um, if you haven't done so, sit down and figure out um, what you can do with your business. Um, things that we've been thinking about is um, at least the onboarding is going to become more complex. Most of you probably already have a, um, a process for um, getting um, the SPF policy uh, or to getting your sender domain um, into your customer's SPF policy. Like the, I think, best practice is to have a subdomain from your customer's domain and have that delegated to you where you can add and edit anything the way you want to have it. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> oh, excuse me, you need to meet me for a second. Where is the mouse? <laughs> ah, back. So, let's see. So, you will have to take care of SPF, and certainly you will also have to take care of DKML because as Alex already said at the beginning, either SPF or DKM passes, and um, there's still some issues out there um, with any mail receiving instance that uh, modifies and alters the email because that usually, uh, and forwards it, because that, that usually will um, break either SPF or DKM. So um, you, probably want to have both in place to have at least one of them survive. Um, then the sending will become more, more complex. You will have to probably have a, a, a process um, up first that checks if DMARC is being, DMARC com, um, compliance is, is being met. Um, because if you don't meet it, you probably don't want to do um, the, the mailing because that will probably have a negative impact on your reputation. And by, by means that, that's all what it's all about, um, their reputation. Um, DMARC is only a mechanism to establish sender identity. 
but uh, the identity is, at least the receivers, is nothing without the reputation that is going to arise from that. So if you are being a good email network citizen, you are able to build up a good reputation over time. And if you're not, you're going to ruin it. So you probably want to check your DMARC policies first and see if all the policies you have on the platform are being met just to build a good thing for the future. So um, what is also here? Well, yeah, the deliverability of obviously is going to become more complex. So you probably want to send out a test mailing or something like that see how the receivers um, accept that and if there are any issues, work on them and then uh, go on. Um, so now this is something um, that we have um, from what, we, what we've been working on, but also from, from discussions we had with large email providers and uh, with, they, with what they told us is important um, when they, uh, as a receiver, evaluate DCRIM and, and uh, SPF and DMARC uh, signed messages. So, um, to some of them, a DMARC policy of none, which is the, the least policy you can set, the least strict uh, limited policy you can set, uh, is actually no policy at all because you think, well, it's testing level. So, you have something, okay, you know it's what, what DMARC is, but you're not using it at all. So, there is no really protect, there's no protection level in that. So it's quite likely that if you have policy is none set on the sending domain that you use, um, that the receiver end is just going to treat it as, as if you're not going to have any DMARC policy at all. You also don't want to have SPF qualifier as plus or uh, question mark neutral uh, because they don't really protect uh, offer protection either. Um, some of the uh, receivers told me that they're likely not going to treat that as, as an SPF policy at all. So you're missing out one of the criteria you should have, and the SPF is the minimum criteria you have to have if you, if you want to step forward and use DMARC. Um, from a discussion we had in the, in the ECOS competence group email last week, um, together with uh, the largest German mailbox providers, but also um, in, uh, in co-work in combination with a few US providers, um, they're all are kind of teaming up right now to come up with one um, policy that works for all the providers. Uh, they said that for large senders, um, <clears throat> the minimum requirement will be relaxed alignment. Um, that is, the envelope sender domain and the RFCH, oh, got it. What is, what is it? You recall it? 8322 from Heather? Eight, I eight. missed the... Uh, uh, there's 5321 and 5322. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think so. So, okay. I say the from header. That's the from header. So, the from header. 5322. Thank you. They must be in alignment. At least they must be in the same domain. Domain. That is that is what the relaxed alignment is. A strict alignment be, would be that the domain part and both uh, um, criteria uh, matches uh, exactly. So, if you want to be sending and want to be accepted with your messages on the platform, you need at least relaxed alignment. And uh, if you want to build reputation, you go for and you strive to get strict alignment. I know and um, from discussions with email service providers that it's hard to get to, to get this to do, but ultimately it's going to be a good investment <coughs> um, in what you will do for your customers. And uh, maybe you want to see it from that point. If you are the, the one who has built up the reputation for your customer, um, it might not. It might be hard for a customer to switch to a different provider because they will have to start um, um, with the reputation again. At least if you have a, a subdomain, if you use a subdomain that's uh, um, specific for your services. Um, and Alex added, uh, you should understand what the include in SPF means. Include in SPF, I don't know how. The middle you are with the technical details means you can include somebody else's SPF record. So whoever uh, is on that, uh, or whatever machine is on that second SPF record is going to be allowed to send on behalf of that domain as well. That is a security implication you simply have to take care of and have to consider. Um, you probably don't want to have a namespace of too many SPF records. Um, or at least, I know it's hard for email service providers because they tend to have many IP addresses but try to keep it as limited as possible. 
Um, Tikim can survive forwarding. Yeah, that's true. And uh, yeah, always ask for aggregate reports. They give you the insight you need to get the, the deliverability you want. <clears throat> One of the things I, I realized, and I think we omitted this, and that's uh, unfortunate, is that it is far easier to, if you're bringing, if you're going to start using a new domain, it is far easier to protect it when you start than to try to bring it back in after you've already, you know, sort of been using it for a while. So if you can, you know, if you're going to say like, oh, our company's going to start using this new domain, at that point, say we're going to do our best to make sure. SPFD, Kim, and DMARC are all working properly and the domain is protected. So. Yeah, because everybody is scared that they might break something with their production mail domain um, while they're in production. Uh, right. so, but, but actually, but on the other hand, uh, uh, I, I don't really disagree, but I tend to, I want to throw in, um, that's what the testing levels are for. You know, you, you can start that policy and say, those are the testing levels, so start with that. I understand that, but you know, if you start out of the gate with proper practices, it may help your deliverability. It may help your, you know, a whole bunch of things as well. So, you know, it shows that you're a dedicated and serious messaging professional kind of. I hate to say it like right. that, but it means you're, you know, you're interested in doing the right thing. So, yeah. So, and then. So I could. There's not a lot of slides here, and I sort of meant this to be a little bit more of a conversation. I hope. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we've talked about, you know, the what now, and this is sort of the what now. Um, and again, this it's really, I think, more for Patrick and I to sort of talk back and forth a little bit. Um, but as DMARC has become more popular, 3 million domains is a small number of domains of the overall number, but is it a large number of important domains? Probably. Um, so you can see that DMARC is becoming more heavily relied on by, by brands and senders all around the world. Uh, this is not something that is limited to the U.S. or Germany or anywhere else. It's, you know, everybody who believes that their their brand or security is important is trying to work towards stronger DMARC policies as best they can. Um, so, and as that is happening, things are starting to sort of build on that. Or um, And so one of the things that is, has recently come out in the last, I guess, three years, four years is something called BIMI. And I know there have been presentations at CSA about, or at, at, yeah, at CSA about BIMI. So we're not going to really dive into it a whole lot, um, other than to say it today it's you know active at a few large mailbox providers, um, and it is moving forward. Um, but it does depend on DMARC and or the the tenants of DMARC. So you have to, you know, you have to properly use DMARC just like you would to protect another domain. And the the trade off is you get to show a logo alongside your message if all of those things work plus you know the mailbox provider you know does their own internal sort of reputation um and that just kind of goes from there but it was something that i definitely want to bring up just because uh i think there's a misunderstanding sometimes of how bimmy works and uh, you know it is definitely uh again something that uses dmark as its, as its foundation or one of its foundations um it, it, it builds on dmark you have to have a dmark compliant message or the BIMI header is not going. The BIMI logo is not going to be shown in your interface. Right, and there's. I mean, there are, is, yeah, there are other parts of it, which is why I didn't want to say it's the only foundation. But there, you know, there are. Uh, it is. Yeah, it's, it's a core tenant of how BIMI works. So, is there anything else you want to add to that? I'm sorry, Patrick. I think it's good. Yeah, um, I think BIMI is going to hit the market because it's a user interface feature. In the end, it's the users who need to decide if they are going to open the message and follow what's in the message or not. And uh, if they see a logo that's uh, associated with the company they expected a message from, it's going to be a strong indicator to them that they believe this is a valid and trustful message and they should do what's in the message or follow the instructions. So it's it's very likely that it's going that we're going to see BIMI in, uh, in web interfaces and also in regular um, MEA interfaces. Hopefully, hopefully it expands. So, again, so today it's at Yahoo and Fastmail, um, and uh, Gmail is in trial mode, and, and so that's or in a pilot mode. So that's coming eventually, I suppose. So, uh, so the the next item here we have is something called DMARC Biz, and so this is actually uh, so we talked many times that DMARC in general has been gone through a process called uh, it's within the ITF. So it has become a a document it has an RFC number that RFC is 7489 um, 
but over the years we've learned some things and so we're going to make some changes uh nothing drastic i don't think um but just some things that need to be clarified or things that people don't really use and we're just going to get rid of so that it, again it makes a clarification um mm. and maybe you know add a few other things in there that people can use to help leverage uh, dmark um so that's a process that we're going through so there's a there's a mailing list there and there's a, a website um so the idea there is that you know if you want to participate we're more than happy to have participants. Uh, it's, you know, it always helps to have folks who use this in their day job, in the real world, provide feedback and say, you know, I, I use this feature or uh, or I wish I had a feature that did this because X, Y, Z. And so that kind of feedback is good for, for the people that are designing these protocols, these mechanisms. So I think Patrick, it has some allergies that are out of control. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm a, sorry, I'm having serious problems with my throat right now. Right now. Uh, do you have anything to add to the DMARC base? Yeah, if I can talk, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, um, yeah, I, actually, it's a shout out um, to all the senders out there <clears throat> um, because IGF is a community effort. If you want to see something happen in DMARC, you better get involved because in the end, <clears throat> it's going to be you when it uh, comes to to um, um, Closing a an, um, and a draft and making make it become an, an RFC um, to be there, raise your voice and say, "Listen, I want to have this on board or not." So, I think um, uh, actually I don't know. <clears throat> Is has has DMARC been very receiver end driven or sender driven? It's a little bit of both, and there's obviously there's also <laughs> the DMARC vendors who uh, who you know sell service related to this. I think everybody from all sides are really saying like, you know, hey, I don't use this or I don't use that um, or I really wish that we had this. And, you know, it, there are things that I sometimes wish we had in DMARC, uh, you know, and so that aren't there. And so we, sometimes we talk about those things. But uh, I think it's really there's a lot of feedback coming from all sides. But again, more feedback is not necessarily it's not a bad thing. I mean, it helps us move forward in a way that it's a, it creates a mechanism that everybody is is happy with and wants to use um and so that's that's really the best thing that i can say is you know if you think you're interested let's do it um get involved so and it, it can be just as simple as you know you can send your an email to myself or patrick and say i don't really know how to go about doing this but i would like to see something that does x y you know th this feature and, you know i think this would be really useful and we can propose it on your behalf if you you know if you're not comfortable so Hmm. Um, so Patrick, I'll let you handle the next one because I uh, I only know a little bit about that one. So, so yeah, I'm um, um, I'm not only a CEO of Sys4, but I'm also a leader of the competence group for email at Eco in Germany, and uh, we've been discussing and we've been, actually we've been following DMARC um, development for many years now. We started started off many years ago when I think PayPal. Uh, as one of the founders of, of DMARC came up and proposed it. And um, knowing the German um, jurisdiction, we immediately said, no, forensic report is not going to happen in Germany. They're not going to be allowed. And uh, ECO was, uh, was the one to step forward and um, did an evaluation of that and came back uh, and said, no, it's not, it's not going to be okay to do forensic reports, at least in Germany. But, but aggregate reports are okay. That's how we... Um, Eco used the money we put into Eco to do something for the whole email community in Germany. So um, right now, uh, DMARC is production ready, and all the platforms out there um, are um, very actively discussing what they will do with their policies, what they think is going to happen on the sender side, on, uh, on how the receiver side, what their staging procedures are. Um, we're in the midst of it. So you can really hear the whole. Um, all of the people we received the humming from from all of the productivity that's going in there right now and we expect to see um <clears throat> if not if not testing but um first production levels of dmark in germany by end of the year um there's a larger platform it takes a while um to roll everything out but um um, the policies are clear, and uh, the policies between email providers also seem to be clear. We just had a meeting last week where um, I, uh, I really enjoyed listening to the different um, providers um, coming up with the same idea and the concept of what they want to do. So 
the, the goal is set and they, they simply have to step forward and do it now and roll out. And I, I expect that this will hit the, uh, <clears throat> the public sector um, by end of the year. There's also, <clears throat> sorry, another um, initiative, which is called Messi U, um, which is a very nice acronym. <laughs> I like that very much because it's modern email security standards for email in the EU, <clears throat> which is a mess right now and should be better in its, in its future. That's why they call it Messi U. And that's a different, um, that's a different uh, EU um, citizenship countries um, that are discussing um, right now how emails should be exchanged between uh, should be exchanged at government level um, within the next year or in the future. And they've also come to a point where they said we want sender certification, and they also are aiming for. Um, <clears throat> most of them are aiming for strict alignment. So, if you send messages out to government, um, federal um, agency, or anything like that. You probably want to make sure you have um, a working DMARC policies and experiences with DMARC as well. <clears throat> um, are you aware? This, are they are they pushing for reporting from the government entities? Do you know that? <clears throat> since since they seem to be you know since they're pushing the standards, are they? I I, I feel like some of them are, but I don't know about all of them. They want to report um, because they understand it's it's um, it's part of fostering the whole ecosystem of DMARC system. Like I said before, if you want to start sending with a DMARC policy, you need somebody to report and tell you um, if you are failing the policies or something going wrong. So they want to be part of that ecosystem and want to report. And they also want to have, um, uh, and they also want to require others to to uh, to require reports. But let me just stop for a second. Did I did I get your question correctly, or did I misunderstand it? No, I think you're okay. I think you're, it's fine. Yeah. <clears throat> So, so they want that, and as far as it concerns the um, government level, they're being government level are um, um, are concerned about data leakage. So um, they're not sure if they will be using any DMARC reporting or monitoring platform or um, DMARC monitoring platforms that either runs on, on premises or where they get guaranteed that their data is not going to lose Europe, uh, they're not going to leave Europe. Sorry, <clears throat> which is important. In, in the syndromes and of what um, governments in Europe. Okay. Uh, just a Go second. Ahead. We, we sure. have mm -hmm. a few questions from Pierre Emmanuel. Um, maybe you want to ask your questions live, Pierre. Um, I give you the right. So if you want to, you can um, ask your question. You just need to unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, hi, nice can... to meet you. Um, I'm, I live in France. Like my um, my accent uh, can uh, can say that on my on my behalf. Um, yeah. So my frustration is uh, about uh, the DMARC um, uh, is not widely uh, deployed um, because it's not a requirement <laughs> in uh, in EU um, for government or financial institutions or Every business is. Um, what is the? Um, um, do you have information about that? Like uh, the Europa um, dot EU will require for <coughs> enforcement. Well, there is no um, there is no binding requirement out there at the moment. Um, as far as I know. <coughs> Um, the MSU group is preparing for a, a requirement, at least at government level, for interchange of information between the different governments in the EU. ENISA, as a <clears throat> top agency for that, for um, IT strategies and policies in, in Europe, is also preparing to um, um, at least foster um, SPFT Kim in DMARC. Um, that was something that was discussed three weeks ago. I think it was three weeks ago in a MSU meeting, um, but they're at the, at the beginning of the whole process. Um, maybe they're going to hop on the train and do whatever um, MSU group has been doing because they've been doing a lot of groundwork during the last two years. Um, and as far as it concerns banks and other financial institutes, <clears throat> 
I can tell, I, I can only speak for Germany. In Germany, there's a so-called Kritis for Ordnung. That's a, that's a, that's a, a government level document that requires um, certain branches of uh, industry that are belong to be critical for the survival of Germany <clears throat> to follow certain higher IT level standards. And um, it's quite likely that um, in combination with the Kritis for Ordnung, they're going to impose um, sender authentication as 50 Kim D mark um, on those um, groups as well. Um, there's also um, a so-called technical guideline uh, 030 3108 from the BSE, that's a, a federal government agency for IT security in Germany, um, where they, uh, which are the currently re-evaluating and uh, updating, and sender authentication is going to be part of that this time too. It started off as something, I guess actually it was something I think where Alex and I get to, got to know each other a few years ago, when it started about um, TLS, Dane, uh, start in MTA, SDS, things like that. That's, that's when we met first. Huh? Mm -hmm. So um, the whole um, SPF DKIM DMARC uh, group is going to be part of that in the um, in the updated version of the technical guideline 3108. <coughs> Pierre, Pierre, were you specifically asking about uh, organizations in France or just generally across Europe? Um, yeah, in France, all, but Europe is um, is the scope uh, we, I hope. <clears throat> so I, I can't speak for Anisa, but I can tell what I heard, what Anisa told. And I don't know if, if they're going to do that, but the plans are they want to foster certain technologies um, which they believe to be important for a, a, a modern <clears throat> internet, um, among which are um, transport encryption wherever possible, and you have to comply if you don't, um, sender authentication, IPv6, uh, and other standards that we believe to be important. Um, DNSSEC, for example, also. I'm a DNSSEC person, so I'm very happy about that. Um, <clears throat> so. Those standards are on their role and they're, um, they want to foster them. So um, certainly not tomorrow because Indonesia is large and they have to cover all of Europe, but it's going to be there. Yeah. Okay, thank Mikey, you very much. There... Oh, sorry. Mikey, uh, thank you, Pierre. Mikey, you said there was another question? Um, yeah, we have a few more questions. Um, do you want to answer them now or later at the end? I'm not sure. Do you, do you want to say, oh, we only have one more bullet point if you, I don't know which way you'd rather us go. We, um, they are not live, That's but I can. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Let's, uh, um, I can read the questions out loud if you want to. Um, the question, the first question was, how does DMARC pass help me as a receiver if the sender only use SPF with like a half million of IPs in there, could still be a phishing mail? So you're, um, I hope I'm understanding this correctly. How does DMARC help me if uh, they're including a domain that includes millions of IPs? Is that basically what they're saying? Is that? I think so, yes. So the question is from Tobias. Uh, if you want to ask a question, so you can say something. But um, I think that's the question, yeah, so far. So, I mean, it's it's hard to, if you're using something where you include uh, Outlook.com, for example, they have lots of IP addresses. Uh, I mean, that's something you have to decide if you're willing to do. I mean, you have to trust the security of the platform you're using that they won't let somebody else send as your domain. And that's something that you sort of have to work with. Um, you know, I can't, I can't tell you what the security is at Outlook. That's, I, I again, I'm, I hope I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, but you know, that's really up to the security of the platform you're using. So we can't. You know, so if you're saying Outlook.com is allowed to send as my domain and somebody else somehow gets access to your account, there's nothing that can be done about that, right? That's, you know, ultimately that's a user level security, not a domain level security. So, uh, Patrick, is, is anything you want to add there? Yeah, yeah the, um, the the um, sender authentication is a short term goal because you're sending a message and it becomes authenticated and that's it. The long term goal is to get a good reputation. So if you have abuse on your platform um, that you use for sending and you have many IP addresses and let's say one or two or three or be it 10 IP addresses 
are being abused. I, um, I expect you will learn about that and you will do something about that. And it's going to have only a short impact on what you've been doing in the long run. That's just probably not going to have an impact on your um, reputation if you tend to send messages um, for a long time, which are not being used for abuse. So the, the ultimate goal is, and that's why you should start. You should should be start using, um, should sorry, should start using DMARC as soon as possible, as you should start and get um, a reputation and build that reputation. Um, the question was from um, Tobias, uh, and he wants to ask something. <laughs> so Tobias, you could speak now. Ah, oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hello, to <Tobias>. Sorry, Patrick. <laughs> hey. Go ahead. Hi, Alex. Hello. Um, Who let him in here? <laughs> it's a special so, device. Yeah? <laughs> so the, the, the question is, is essentially about the fact that a lot of people um, do not understand SPF, but simply fixing the issues. So every time it pops up that, oh, it did, this, this was not delivered because SPF uh, prevented forwarding. Oh, let's add that IP address, blah. Or the already mentioned example of hey for sure i'm adding my salesforce um, or let's phrase it different my dollar salesforce ip range one my dollar salesforce ip range three my dollar salesforce uh, ip range five my outlook.com or dollar outlook.com and dollar yeah. google.com ip range and suddenly i have a half a million ips in my spf record and that doesn't help the receiver of such mails in any way because DMARC does not allow me to say that I'm always signing with DKIM. It simply says, hey, pass. You, you're coming from one of this one of this 1.5 million IP addresses right. that the sender of that domain is allowed to send mails through. So DMARC is useless as a, on the receiver level as soon as it hits the fan with that setting. Well, because I cannot say that, oh, it needs to have DKIM. Right, so you're saying I'd like to I'd like to both of my authentication mechanisms to be active and, and validated properly in order for DMARC to work. Is that what you're saying? No, I, I want to say that it's always DCAM and I don't give a fuck about SPF at all. <laughs> I mean, you can just de you can just depublish your SPF if that's what you want to do, right? You can just rely on DCAM, and we have we have seen people who rely solely on SPF because they don't want their messages to be forwarded. So they say if it didn't come from our server, just just act like it, you know, just throw it away, basically. They don't care. They were P equals reject SPF only. They did, didn't want to deal with DKIM. They didn't think that it, they couldn't, they didn't want to try to trust forwarding messages. And that happens. That's that's a security policy that somebody can choose. Um, to, I, you know, the other part of what you're saying is, you know, you're talking about does, you know, if I include a half a million domains or half a million IP addresses, I mean, those IPs still have reputation. It's not like, I mean, you still have to be able to send, but I understand what you're saying. And there's really, I don't think there's a good mechanism for that uh, because ultimately what you're saying is if I've included gmail.com or google.com and outlook.com and Salesforce and MailChimp and all the, and all of these things, you're right. You end up with, you know, <laughs> half a million IPs that any, any of those can send as you. And so mm -hmm. I, I do agree. Like if that's a concern that you have as a, as a messaging security person, if you, you know, you can say, you know, we're not going to include an SPF for MailChimp. You must use DKIM. And if it, if the message doesn't pass after that, that's fine. And there are different ways to approach the messaging security as it relates to DMARC. You don't have to just, you don't need both. You can just rely on one or the other. Does that sort of answer your question, Tobias? Kind of. I, it it, it yeah. doesn't solve my issue with DMARC <laughs> because DMARC does not help me in defining what I want to achieve. And, and you're asking it from a different side. You're asking it from the receiver side, not from the sender side, because you already understand as a as a sender, you know that you wouldn't want to include half a million domains from an ESP. Yeah, but you might say, I don't want to use your shared space. I Give me my dedicated IP, and that's the only one I'm going to list. And that's OK. To be honest, mentioned something that's very important. Actually, we didn't really put that much emphasis on it yet. Um, as we speak, the internet is changing. Of course, it's, it's trivial, it's always doing that. But um, we're changing from an IPv4 to an IPv6 network. And uh, you can't do block lists or allow lists um, with IPv6 because it's just, it's just too. <clears throat> um, you can. It's a, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you don't want to. So 
the receivers are moving away from from IP based policies, and they're they're looking for something else they can use. And actually, DKIM and DMARC are the kind of policies they're hopping on. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if, if that from that point, Tobias is correct um, when he says he's not interested in in, uh, in SPF policies because they're kind of useless. They, they don't help for his way of building policies anymore. They're it's easily DKIM broken. After. They're easy. Yeah, they're easily broken and easily abused. And that's <laughs> you know, it depends. It, it, I mean, Tobias, to your point, really, yeah, yes, you're correct. But ultimately, you know, it depends on you need to have somebody you can trust as your security person, your messaging security personnel to say when somebody shows up to say i'd like to include salesforce to say is that the right thing for us to do so but yeah but that, that's fine but on the other end why doesn't gima give me the ability to specify a little bit more strict what i expect my traffic to look like so currently i i have this binary output of dmarks that is pass or fail if we are not looking and into dns issues and all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. in the end it's pass or fail mm -hmm. and it simply dmark doesn't care if it was an SPF pass or DKIM pass and all this kind of stuff. So why don't I get a, a so possibility you're as a center to say <laughs> all my DKIM, uh, DMARC should only pass if I sign that with DKIM? So you would like a mm -hmm. matrix of decisions? No, I, I would like to have a policy like currently no, no. there's RSPF and RDKIM that only says I have to do relaxed or strict alignment, mm -hmm. nothing more. But what is about I want to have DKIM is always there to right. announce no, no. to, to, to and that, receive. And that's what I'm saying is you would like, not necessarily for you, but you would like there to be yep. the options of a matrix of decisions, not necessarily in your use case, but it might be that I say SPF must always be there. So how does the sender indicate that to the receiver to say, it's nice exactly. that we are going to sign things with DKIM, but we always require SPF. If it doesn't have SPF, yeah. and we want you to throw it away, we don't care what DKIM shows. And I mean, yeah. we can, there's no, you know. There's no way to say it needs to be mandatory or optional. Yeah, right. And we should have something. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because there's still the sender, it's a receiving community who could say that if you want to be honored, DMARC at us, you have to do that mandatory. Yep. Uh, but it, it should be optional in the DMARC record to say, I ought to say as a sender that I always sign with DKIM. Right. And that's impossible currently. I cannot say that. So DMARC is not really helping me here. Well, Tobias, I can take this back to the DMARC biz and we can certainly suggest that's it and see what awesome. folks say. Yeah. I, I don't know if you're on the list, but if not, you know, we know how to find you. <laughs> Just in case any any other of the senders doesn't know Tobias, Tobias is a very well known person yeah. and he knows how to address the ITF himself. And make himself heard. So um, I, expect, I expect you and us <laughs> to sit at the IDF meetings and make ourselves heard. <laughs> I Hopefully. think we should move on to the next question. Sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Yep. But thank you, Tobias. Thank you, really. <laughs> so, um, the next, I think we have two more questions. So, um, how much of a positive impact do you see if we use an aligned subdomain for image hosting and for redirect tracking ULS? Do you mean strict alignment or um, or relaxed? I think it's a content scanner question, and that's a little too nuanced. I don't know that's really. You're talking. Well, I don't know who asked the question, but I think they're asking in the content of the message, should those URLs be aligned with the 5322 domain? And I think that's highly dependent on who you're sending the message to. I, that's not a that's not a part of DMARC. That's part of a secret sauce that receivers have in their filtering software, and they're probably not going to tell because um, they will open that for miscreants, and they they would figure out what a way would be to push messages on the platform uh, without the receivers wanting to do that to get those. Okay, yeah. and uh, the last question for today. I think that's a really good for the end. Um, hi there, what can I do if the reputation of my domain is down, for example, on Hotmail or Gmail? What is your rec recommendation? How to improve the reputation again? Of course, also, I do have SPF, DKIM and DMARC on my domain. Do you have a recommendation for him? I mean, this is really something that you would talk to your deliverability folks about, um, or if you are one. I mean, there's there's a lot of general guidelines out there about engagement tracking and things like that or or you know if someone has converted a sale recently that kind of thing if they haven't opened a message in two years you know that may be an indication they're not interested in your messages or it's a dead mailbox 
Um, so, you know, it's really hard to say, but I mean, you know, Hotmail and Gmail have a lot of intricate processes to determine if a message is spam or not, you know, and they have different levels. Um, so, but I will tell you that user engagement is something that is important to them, so. My recommendation is find out what the reason is what the, or what the reasons are that give you bad reputation. Because there might be different reasons for I remember many years ago, one of my, uh, one of my best friends asked me if I could help him set up his new mail system. And uh, it was completely new by then. He was, uh, he was having his virtual machine at some cloud provider. And it turned out the cloud provider had IPv4 addresses that really had been burned by spammers before. So there was no way he was going to send messages with the IP address he's going to have. So he, in the end, he had to change and go to a different cloud provider that was not using burned IP addresses. So in this case, the IP address was the thing that was burned and there was a bad reputation assigned to that. Um, but you might have a bad reputation for somebody else sending spam on behalf of your domain. And it's or if you're IP on a shared IP. Yeah, if you're on a shared IP address and somebody else is could be making a mess out of that IP and you may not even know, so. So the, the, the good thing is actually to start taking a look at your own sender domain and finding out what causes the bad reputation and then start tackling that. There, there is no there is no one, one size fits all answer to that, certainly, sorry. I think that's it. We have all questions answered now, so cool. Um, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, participants, for joining us today and your time. Um, if you have questions afterwards, um, you can write us an email. Um, you got the uh, we will you will get the recording I think tomorrow or the next day after. And um, yeah, just contact us if you have questions, or you can contact, of course, Patrick and Alex directly. And yeah, thanks again for your time, Alex and Patrick. Thank you for having us. Bye bye. Thank have you. Bye.